Our last speaker is Dr. James Carlson of drjamescarlson.com. Dr. Carlson, thank you. First off, I'd like to thank the Weston Price Foundation for inviting me here to speak today. My take on everything is a little bit different because I'm actually a board-certified family physician with a prior undergraduate study in biochemistry and molecular cell biology. Like Adele, I turned around one day and found myself 70 pounds overweight. Well, not quite as much as, you know, I was a little heavier. And my uh, a lipid panel revealed my HDL to be very low, triglycerides high, borderline diabetic. And I did to myself what I had counseled. I was six years into the private practice of medicine at that point. I did to myself what I counseled thousands of my patients to do before that, low fat, low cholesterol. So there I embarked in the low fat, low cholesterol dietary scheme. I got heavier, and I failed to mention my blood pressure was also higher. I got heavier, blood pressure went higher, HDL went lower, triglycerides higher, blood sugar uh, was just, you know, uh, 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 I was diabetic. So I did what I, every other physician or most physicians out there do. I put myself uh, on medication because I wasn't trained to understand that the dietary guidelines I was following were incorrect. And it wasn't until I read a, a classic book called Protein Power that I started to understand. And I want to emphasize the word I'm using here, understand. For the correct way to eat is not a belief, a theory, an opinion or a supposition. They are biochemical facts. Entering this uh, auditorium today, you see the alternative nutritional guidelines, and I say to myself, really? They're alternative? Well, wait a minute, they're, they're the correct guidelines. But let's go back to when I was heavier, uh, rotund, and didn't understand, read protein power, put myself on the correct way to eat, and it's fascinating too, because when I was reading that book, I was doing this a lot, I should have known, I should have known. Because I had biochemical training, I should have known and understood the biochemical pathways. Started myself on low carbs, magical things began to happen. I was eating more fat, more cholesterol, more protein. What I also counsel my patients is, this is not a zero carb, high fat, high cholesterol, high protein regime. It is lower carbs, more appropriate fat, more appropriate cholesterol, more appropriate protein. I lost the weight. I came off my blood pressure medication, my statin du jour, which at that time was Lipitor, and I thought I was onto something. But then I said, you know what, maybe I'm a, a, a genetic mutant. I'm eating more fat, I'm eating more cholesterol, it's working for me, maybe it won't work for other people. So I did the, uh, I took the SAFE uh, course and I enlisted the help of family and friends, and I said, mom, dad, sister, brother, friends, uh, eat you know, more fat, more cholesterol, more protein, and let's see, see what the outcomes were. I guess my thinking was if anything went wrong, they probably wouldn't sue me. So they actually, outcomes were very, very good. And then I started very selectively selecting patients in my practice to put them on this particular eating style. I try to refrain from using the term diet here because to me, diet equates with transiency. It's a transient thing. This is a lifelong behavior behavioral change. One patient led to another patient, led to 100 patients. I've been putting my patients on low, car, uh, low carb, more fat, cholesterol, and protein for nearly 14 years. I have thousands upon thousands of success stories, and they continue to this day. I do not need to use medications for, say, cholesterol or blood pressure lowering. And it's inter interesting with the whole soul thing, lowering systolic blood pressure by, what was it, 3 to 6% or something? Are you kidding me? All right. What I do know is that once someone embarks on a low-carb lifestyle change and eats more of the very things we're told not to eat, their systolic and diastolic blood pressures drop dramatically. And if I have somebody walk into my office with a 160 over 110 blood pressure, which is elevated, if I feel they're going to follow my dietary advice, contrary to the uh, a Joint National Committee, whatever number it is now, approach for treating blood pressure, I'll tell them, I won't start them on blood pressure medicine. I'll put them on low carb, more fat, more cholesterol, more protein. They'll come back in a couple of weeks. The pressures will be 140 over 90. A couple more weeks. Oh, by golly, the blood pressures are normal. This is feeding people, suggesting to people 
exactly opposite to what the USDA 2010 guidelines are suggesting. I have to admit, when I read the guidelines, two words came to mind. This is the USDA 2010 dietary guidelines. Two words came to mind, disdain and incredulity. And then I said, you know what, maybe I'm being a little too hard on them because I didn't always understand the correct way to eat. Now, about 14 years out, putting patient after patient after patient on the correct way to eat, not the accepted approach, which is what the USDA accepted approach is, uh, not having to use pharmaceutical agents as much as my peers, you know, to me, I, you know, I, I've seen the positive outcomes. I also understand the biochemistry. I'll read USDI guidelines, the 2010 guidelines, and I'll be like, are you kidding me? I mean, is anybody paying attention here? And they're behind closed doors. They're de not even debating. I don't, I don't think I, I, I can use that word. You know, and before this, before this presentation today, I believe it was yesterday, I was going through the costs associated with four main diseases that I treat the vast majority of time without medication. And if you come to my practice and you're on these medicines or medications for these diseases, I, I oftentimes can get you off, all right? So, you know, what if I would say this to the audience, that, that heart disease, and it, heart disease is very apropos today, because what's today? Valentine's. Valentine's Day, very apropos. Heart disease, how much does it cost us? It costs us 2010 figures, $316.4 billion in heart disease costs. Diabetes. Now, what if I were to say that type 2 diabetes was completely curable, treatable, preventable with simple dietary guidelines? Would you believe me? I see it every day in my practice. Total co cost, direct and indirect of diabetes, $174 billion. Moving on to obesity. Obesity costs $168 billion. Uh, when I was studying for my MBA um, uh, many years ago, I did a paper, uh, it was referred to or called The Economic Implications of Physicians' Ignorance, and I came across a staggering figure, uh, and these are 2005 figures, of how much we spend on GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, commonly called heartburn. And we spend, in 2005 figures, and I'm sure that figure's higher, $2 billion a week. That's $104 billion a year. Let's add those figures up, shall we? So I did that, and that's, you know, I can't do that in my head right now under the, under the pressure here. So with $762 billion that could be saved, or close that could be saved, by basically treating patients or suggesting to patients the correct way to eat. I believe the current healthcare costs are 2.6 to 2.7 trillion dollars, do the math, this comes out to about 26% of health care costs. The big buzzword around Washington is change, we want change, let's go get change. You want change? Listen to the correct way to eat and not the accepted way to eat. I get this all the time, I, I, I'm bad, I tease my patients, I have to do this, it's just in my nature. I'll get Mr. and Mrs. Jones, not their real name of course, and I'll say, you know, eat more fat, more cholesterol, more protein, lower carbs. And they'll go, well, doctor, that's not the correct way to eat. Should I do that? And of course, you know, they go and they do it. And this always happens. Their blood work, you know, I'll get a lipid panel back, which will be horrific. High triglycerides, fats in the blood, low HDL, that's the good cholesterol. Blood pressure, borderline, maybe a borderline sugar. Four months later, I'll repeat the blood work. I'll sit them down. They're following the low carbs. And I'll know this just from looking at the biochemistries. And I'll sit them down and I'll look at them right in the eye and I'll say, are you eating more fat and cholesterol? They'll be like, they'll, they'll start to sweat. Yeah, 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 you told me to. Are you sure you're eating more fat and cholesterol? Did you get rid of, you know, whole grains and things like that? Yeah, doc, you told me to. Their numbers are stellar. Their triglycerides drop, their HDLs elevate. And let me just sidetrack a little bit. The only thing that I've seen dramatically elevate HDLs in nearly 20 years of clinical practice is the consumption of more fat and more cholesterol in our foods. And that goes for saturated fat as well. That's a cuss word where I come from, saturated fat, can't eat that. But that's the thing that helps elevate HDL and lower triglycerides. My stance is a tad different. I'm not, I'm on the front lines of medicine. I'm reading these uh, journal articles, uh, most of which support low fat, low cholesterol, and I, I, I just get angry, I, I get frustrated. I'm like, are you kidding me? This stuff doesn't work in clinical medicine.